Valley, the other Dan of New England AI. I help coordinate the speakers for the group. We are taking August off, but we'll be back again in force in September. So if you are interested or know anyone who might be interested in presenting, feel free to contact me. We are actually booked. We have a booking in fall of 2014, so nothing is too early. I'd like to introduce Ronnie Nelkin, uh, Director of Research at Outbrain. He and I are both clients at C3, the Cambridge Co-working Center, so I've been seeing him there for several years now, and it's great to have him here presenting tonight. So without further ado, Ronnie Nelkin. Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, okay, great. So the, the, um, the title of this talk is um, uh, The Machine Learning Guide to Fine Dining. I think it's um, extremely appropriate that we'll, the, the real title is you know, the, the fi Machine Learning Guide to Fine Dining, AI, Pizza, and Beer. So you know, we have the full spectrum of uh, what I want to talk about. Um, a, a little bit about how this came about. So um, I was thinking about uh, what talk I, I'd be giving, and um, you know, uh, sometimes when you um, slack off and uh, look at LinkedIn, you sometimes see people that you might know, and I often find myself looking at those people, and those are people I was just thinking about somehow. Uh, LinkedIn automatically knows exactly who you're thinking about. So there's some magic going on there. And I think uh, a lot of machine learning feels like that. So a lot of uh, the algorithms that you know, we work on uh, day in, day out have this sort of um, magic and the ability to make us feel happier. And my immediate thought is how can we use some of that magic in our own personal lives? And uh, um, the idea here is, is really to take some of the insights from some algorithms that I'll go over briefly and see whether we can apply them to, to our own personal human decision making in a fairly uh, benign domain, you know, uh, just fine dining, nothing about uh, any life or death choices. And uh, in the process and complete the loop in the other way around, see whether we can learn some some, about, some insights about these algorithms in a familiar setting. Okay, so I, I want to talk about um, three different problems. Um, the first one is how to pick the best restaurant, especially with your, when you're with a group of people, whether you should trust your server's recommendations, uh, whether you should stick with a favorite dish or try a new thing. Now, these are admittedly very first world problems, right? There's not, uh, we're not going to solve uh, cancer here. But the idea is to illustrate some of these algorithms in a you know, fun setting. And uh, feel free to ask me questions uh, throughout. It's supposed to be a discussion more than a real talk. OK, so let me start with the first question. Uh, you know, this is uh, Google Maps for restaurants in Boston. There's a ton, ton, ton of restaurants, how do you pick the best one? Um, and it's tempting to try and uh, optimize, you know, find the best criteria for the restaurant. And, and I think um, one of the insights we can take from machine learning is that of uh, combining different, uh, different decision methods or different classifiers. And there's a wide literature about um, uh, ensemble methods, about uh, rank aggregation, and I want to talk a little bit about that and how can we apply that to this weird problem. Um, okay, so, so the setting is very, very simple. Let's say we have, uh, you know, three different restaurants which are conveniently named A, B, and C. Uh, a, Asta, B, Grill 23 and Bar, and C, Craigie and Main. By the way, I've never been to any of those, so I don't know if they're any good or bad. And assume you're going out with a group of friends, John, Paul, and George. Ringo was away that day. 
Um, and, and you have their choices, right? So you can, you can just poll them. You can ask each one what, the best, what his best choice is. But that loses information if you just get one choice. So it's very uh, tempting to get like a ranked list of choices from people. And then the question is, how do you combine them? Uh, and, and this is a problem I actually encountered in, in my day job, where you have a combination of different classifiers. They're not from the same template. You know, you have one classifier that's, uh, that works with one method, another that works with another method. How do you combine their choices? And uh, one uh, very um, good way is to use uh, what's known as Borda count. So Borda was uh, um, a French, I don't know, politician, or w when they just started with, uh, with the notion of politics during the French Revolution, and he came up with this method of combining choices. So it's a very, very uh, simple method. You have a score for the first choice, let's say three for the first choice, two for the second choice, and one for the, first, for the third choice, and you just sum up, the, sum up those scores. So uh, let's say A right, got first choice once, twice, and then it got two in the, in the third choice, so it gets a score of eight. Okay, and that's a very simple method. You can do that for A, B, and C. You get a score. Um, the nice thing about this method is it's very, very simple, but people have shown that actually it doesn't always give you the, the right choice, you know, the majority vote. And I, I'd like to argue that maybe the majority thing isn't the right, the right choice in the case of going out with a group of friends, right? Maybe you don't want to pick the majority. Maybe you want to emphasize consensus. So one of the known factors about uh, board account is it, it really emphasizes consensus. So uh, it gives uh, some weight to the choices that are not necessarily the first ones, but are down, down there in the list, but they also play a role. Um, so that's fine. That's, that's the board account. Um, there's a few issues that are missing in, in board account. So board doesn't handle partial lists well. What if uh, you know one of your friends likes some restaurants and didn't even consider other restaurants that some others uh, consider? Um, it doesn't handle well uneven comparisons. So uh, uh, what if uh, you know one of your? Th this happens with my kid, right? My kid. My kids' choices are chipotle. Uh, you know, they're not even relevant for me, right? So, so you have these cases in, of uneven choices, right? Where one, one group of people focuses on one set of restaurants and, and another group might focus on another. So how do you handle that? Um, the heuristic used in Borda is really simple, right? The majority, uh, the majority or, or the, those ranked higher are better, uh, but you can uh, imagine different heuristics. For instance, you can imagine um, it's not enough just to have a high score, you have to have a high score against good candidates. So there's uh, another really cool method. Uh, by the way, I'll give, um, I'll give pointers to papers and stuff at the end, uh, which uses Markov chains, which I think is really cool. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, and it's actually something I do use, um, I have used in the past in, in real uh, problems of ensemble classification. Um, the idea with the Markov chain is you can sort of generalize this idea of Borda. So how does this uh, Markov chain work? You can build a graph. The nodes are the restaurants, A, B, and C, again. Um, and the edges represent some sort of preference. For instance, a potential preference. Uh, let's say we'll put in an edge if at least one of the uh, people in, in our group might prefer uh, restaurant A to restaurant B. So this is what I've done here. So uh, if you remember, A was the best choice. So you see that it has a lot of in, in uh, edges. And you can play with the weights. Uh, how do you define the weights exactly, depending on the kind of heuristics you want. And this gives you 
um, a really cool way of representing different heuristics by the way you choose to define these, um, these probabilities on the edges. And once you build this Markov chain, you can do a power method to find the best, uh, you know, to find the stationary distribution, and that sort of tells you where the best choices are. So I think that's a really cool method, uh, both in real life and, uh, and for this problem specifically. You know, how do you combine choices from different, uh, different people? Okay, so far? Please. Um, not necessarily, so it depends. Uh, I don't know if anyone prefers A to B, B to A. I think uh, A is always preferred over B, so there's no real way to go from A to B. Or you can, you can add a line there, but it'll give it a very low probability. So the idea is once you're at A, nobody prefers to go from A to B. And the construction of this Markov chain is uh, edges represent a preference. So if I'm at, you know, if I'm at, uh, at uh, B, I might prefer to go to A, because at least some of the people uh, would prefer going from B to A. And uh, vice versa, it doesn't work. OK? Please. Um, so, so the Markov chain won't get stuck, and uh, so it's um, it's really a, a preference in the weak sense. You know, you either prefer to stay here or move on. Okay, fine. So uh, let, let's move on to the next uh, next question: uh, Should you trust your server's recommendation? Um, and, and this to me sounds just like a classification problem, right? And, and you can do uh, something similar to, to document classification, right? Um, th that's, the, that's the motivation, right? The server comes up with, uh, uh, here's, here are the daily specials. Uh, this is what they're made of. Do you think this will be good for you or not? And uh, a, a classic thing to do is to do some sort of naive base, right? And, and the idea there, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is to go, is to flip the probabilities, right? What we really want to know is whether the, uh, given the recommendation, so the server comes out and say, says, you know, we have uh, ahi tuna with this and that, and you want to know whether that's good, and uh, instead of doing that, which is hard, you can estimate the, you can flip the, the probability to say, I want to estimate, um, given all the things that I know are good, what is the probability that they will be uh, recommended using, uh, using Bayes' rule. Um, and uh, naive Bayes, the way Naive Bayes works is you can divide the, the problem instead of uh, figuring out whether a specific recommendation will be made given uh, things that you know are good. You can divide it into, in the case of unigrams, right, into single words, you can divide it into the ingredients. So for me, for instance, if there's pesto, I know it's going to be bad, you know, I won't even try it. But uh, for other people, of course, the choice might be different, uh, or you can look at uh, combinations. You know, some people say that uh, caviar and white chocolate supposedly together are supposed to be fantastic. I don't know if that's really, uh, really true. Um, this uh, formulation has a well-known problem. What happens if uh, one of the ingredients, you have a zero probability for it, right? So if you have uh, say for ingredient one, you don't know anything about it, what do you do? You, you just get a zero score here and uh, a zero score for the complementary probability. And I have a, a, a clip illustrating what to do. So, so this is the case, right? I don't know anything about I1. And uh, here's a clip from uh, 
Mr. Bean, who has exactly the same problem. I don't know if you can hear this. Okay, he asked for, uh, for this on the menu, and it says steak tartare, and he has no idea what tartare is, so he says, oh, steak. And as you can imagine, it doesn't end well. Okay, so, so this is a fun illustration of uh, what's known as Laplace smoothing, right? Uh, I'm sure that's what the producers of Mr. Bean had in mind. So, you know, if, if you don't know what the ingredient is, you, you just guess, you know, or just ignore it. Add some, some small prior way to it. Um, okay, having said that, I just want to move on to the third question, unless you have any questions about this. Okay, great. So the third question that I wanted to talk about is whether you should stick with a favorite dish or try something new. So this, this happens to me a lot. I tend to get in the rut, right? I, I always go to the same restaurant. I always order the same thing. Uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, interesting literature about uh, multi-arm bandits, so, which I think is really relevant for this. So multi-arm bandits, uh, a one-arm bandit is a colloquial name for a slot machine. Multi-armed bandits is a situation where you have several different slot machines, right? And the gambler's problem is to try to optimize the choice, right? You can try some of them. You can see what the odds are of winning, what the odds are of losing. How do you optimize that choice? Do you stick with one machine that has a good payoff? How much do you spend trying to find new machines? Um, so this is a really well-studied problem, which I think is really uh, appropriate for, for this uh, specific problem and in general for uh, other choices in life. One really simple solution is known as epsilon greedy. So that's pretty much the simplest algorithm you can think of, which says, you know, usually go with what you know, but reserve some probability of trying something completely new. That's uh, that's what this is uh, supposed to be showing. So usually you just go with the, the favorite. And then you divide somehow the, the rest of the probability to trying something completely new. And there's a bunch of other uh, more sophisticated algorithms that have been applied to, to this problem. Um, I've sort of tried to organize them by uh, what kind of information they use and their sophistication, not necessarily their complexity. Some are harder, some are uh, uh, less complicated. But uh, epsilon greedy is the one I just talked about. That's the easiest thing. You can say, okay, um, I've tried these bandits or these dishes before, and I have some notion of uh, what the success rate of that dish is. So maybe. You know, I tried this dish once and uh, it was terrible in this restaurant, but then I'll go ahead and try it again and again until I get it right. So you know how many times you want to try that terrible pesto dish again and again, you know, even though it failed. But uh, theoretically, if you think of this problem uh, in, in this theoretical uh, framework, that, that's uh, what people do. So one thing you can use is exactly the, the previous success ratio. An algorithm that, that uses that is known as softmax. Basically, it tries to divide uh, the probabilities. If I go back to this slide, here, the probabilities of the new dishes based on their success rate. So if it's, successful, if it's been successful in the past, you can, try, you can try it more and more. Another piece of information you can use is how many times you've already tried it. So not just the rate of success, but how many times you've actually tried that dish before. Um, and the idea there is if you try 
um, if you try a dish um, only a few times, you may be willing to try it more. Maybe you'll get surprised for the better. Uh, but if you've tried it a lot of times, you, uh, you might say, okay, I'm giving up. And uh, one very uh, well-known algorithm for that is known as uh, UCB. Basically, that looks at the uh, upper confidence bound. So instead of just looking at the ratio of success, you compute an upper confidence bound. And you use that upper confidence bound as sort of an optimistic um, estimate of the success of your, uh, of your dish. So the idea is that the confidence bound starts off really wide. And then as you try it more and more and more, then you, the confidence bound shrinks. So you don't uh, spend your time on, um, on dishes that you know uh, that you've tried a lot of times. Um, all of these approaches work pretty well when there's a small number of arms in the multi-arm bandit, but don't work really well when you have a lot of choices. And I think they're not really relevant for this specific um, problem of, of uh, dish choice, because we're not going to spend our time you know, trying this dish again and again, that, that stuff. So instead, what people do is they, they build some sort of model of unseen dishes. Um, and there's some cool work on that. So instead of working with the individual arms where you have a lot of them or where it's inappropriate, you build some sort of theoretical model of what, uh, what an arm might look like based on your previous uh, data. And uh, these are a couple of uh, algorithms that, that use that. One is... Uh, uh, GLM UCB, so it's basically using a, a linear model on top of the UCB idea. Um, another cool, uh, cool approach is uh, contextual bandits is another way of looking at it. So you, you, have, uh, you, you build a, a model that looks at vectors of context. So basically, in, in our case, what we'll have is we'll have a dish. We don't know much about that dish, but we can look at, at its ingredients. And uh, based on that, try and estimate whether it will be good or not. And then uh, um, compute some prior estimate for the quality of that dish. And then use that as our uh, um, estimate of whether that dish will be good. Um, with the UCB idea, uh, it's important that we're optimistic. So it's not just that we're using some uh, our, our best estimate of that dish, but we're giving a chance for new dishes to uh, uh, make their way into our regular um, repertoire. Uh, so really, this was like a five-minute tour of, uh, of these algorithms, which is impossible. There's a lot, lot of literature about it, but I think it's really cool to think about it in this, uh, in this domain. Uh, a couple of life lessons that I have from... from um, from bandits, from multi-armed bandits, one is uh, they have this uh, notion of optimism in the face of uncertainty, which I think is great for life. Right? You don't know what you're doing. Uh, you don't know whether it's going to be good, good or bad. Let's be optimistic. And the other thing is, is kind of uh, technical. Uh, all these algorithms are usually analyzed in terms of their regret. So what, would you, what is your um, payoff? from this particular choice that you made relative to other choices that you might have made. But interestingly, usually it's, especially in the, um, in the more advanced papers that talk about uh, learning a model for, um, for the bandits, it's, it's not every available choice, it's every uh, available strategy. And, and I think this is pretty relevant, uh, you know, like, the, like, um, like those articles that said, oh, you shouldn't have bought an iPod, you should have bought uh, Apple stock. So it's not really a comparable choice. So it's not really that you're looking at every possible choice that you made in life and, and saying, oh, I should have done that, I should have done this. It's, it's uh, looking at all the available choices that made some sense, you know, that are relevant within, uh, within your repertoire of things that you might do. But, but that's a little uh, philosophical. Okay, so I, I, I really want to wrap it up here, um, 
So the idea, again, was, was to look at some of these algorithms and see whether they apply to uh, human decision problems. Uh, basically, a lot of these machine learning algorithms try to optimize things that we were also trying to optimize in day-to-day -day life. Uh, the dining thing was just an example, but I think this can be taken even further. And, you know, if you have any ideas, I'd be happy to, to uh, talk to you and uh, think more about this stuff. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, links here that I'll put with the slides for further reading. And I'm happy to take questions. So, the, you know, the easy ones are pretty easy to implement. The, all of these uh, bottom ones, they're pretty easy to implement, and there are some open source implementations. The, the ones that use models um, are typically harder, and there are some, um, there are some open source uh, tools that do this. I can send you a link. Or maybe add it there. In, in terms of the, uh, the dining experience, some of the models are very transparent in terms of you can kind of understand why they made the choice they made. Well, other models are not transparent at all as to why they drive right. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think, you know, maybe if you, if you adopt uh, an outlook where you say, okay, once in a while I'll just go crazy and try something completely out of my comfort zone, you know, just try something and uh, see if it works, that might be helpful. Uh, personally, I'm trying, you know, to apply these things in, uh, in my daily life, but I'm not sure <laughs> that's really, uh, really working. But, but uh, I think it's interesting in, in that in that uh, context, but also I think it's sometimes easier to think about these problems where in, in a, and definitely to, to explain these ideas to people who are not very technical in this context and uh, then really get it to the math and so on. I think I think we have them at, at some uh, subconscious level, you know. Uh, um, so uh, definitely, I don't expect people to you know walk up to to uh, the counter to order something and then open the encyclopedia to see what what everything uh, is. Uh, one of the papers I gave a link to here is actually um, about ingredient ingredient networks. So this is. Uh, a group that uh, looked at um, a bunch of recipes from uh, allrecipes.com and tried to do an analysis of what uh, uh, ingredients are substitutable one for another. So maybe you can build an app that does this. You know that you know. Okay, if you don't like pesto, what else won't you like? You won't you won't like uh, cardamom or whatever. Uh, so so sure, and I, you know I don't expect people to. Uh, walk around with uh, with a calculator when they're ordering, but but maybe you can do it at sort of a intuitive level. Yeah.
Yeah, so, uh, so here I, I looked at uh, single ingredients, but uh, people often look at um, pairs of ingredients, or, you know, just between us, it's, it's documents, right? It's documents and words, so they look at pairs of words or trigrams of words, uh, so, so then you can really learn what your preference is for each uh, combination, as well as for the individual ingredients. So, so there's a principled way of, of dealing with that, and there's smoothing. What if you know something about, you know, um, if you know something about the, the pair, but you don't know, uh, you, you, you don't know anything about the pair, but you do know about one of them, uh, and Laplace smoothing with Mr. Bean is, is the most naive way of doing it, but there are smarter ways of uh, combining these. question? I don't know. <laughs> that, that's a great question. Uh, I haven't thought about that. So I guess, yeah, so we, you don't want to all order the same dish. Uh, maybe share, but not with others in your group. <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, so it really depends on the complexity of the problem. If, if all you have is a few simple choices, do something, uh, you can even do something uh, simpler than greedy, um, which is, you know, try a bunch of things, see if they work, and then go on from there. Uh, really, the top ones are used when there's a bunch of different uh, choices, like with uh, ad optimization, right? You have thousands of ads, and you try to figure out the best one. There's a paper from uh, Yahoo that did that, of trying to pick the best ads in that, uh, in that context. Right, so, so you can think of, uh, I think one of the best models is uh, the confidence, uh, upper confidence bound. So let's say you try these dishes. Right, so, so, you, know, as, so you can compute how, much, how many tries you need to do that, right? So you need to try it a bunch of times. No, so, so the contextual is actually better. The contextual will lower the amount. It's a more sophisticated model, so you don't have to try as much. But with, uh, for instance, with the UCB, you can see, uh, we can work out you know, how many tries uh, are necessary to actually get to a confidence bound that's, uh, that you're uh, confident with. Um, with the greedy, it also matters uh, how much you're willing to spend, you know, how many times you're willing to go and, and have a crappy dish. So you can play with the epsilon, right? You can, you can play with these parameters. You can say, um, it also probably depends on, on the context, right? You're going, you're going out with, uh, with an important uh, client, right? You don't want to, uh, to screw it up. You, you want to, to make uh, the correct choice. Uh,
So I think the, um, you know, the, the, the simpler models on the left-hand side are better for narrower phase. So the, these are the more narrow ones, you know, on the left-hand side, basically. But you can play with the parameters, you know, you can, uh, there's, uh, there's risk tolerance, there's a bunch of uh, different factors that, that come into play. machine learning uh, application or in this uh, toy, toy domain? So, uh, right. So, uh, you know, in my day job uh, where uh, we're trying to optimize uh, recommendations, uh, we, we try to go to the uh, higher end models, you know, try to build a model of uh, the context, the user, and so on, try to do. Yeah, basically go as simple as you can while it works and, uh, yeah. Sure. Thank you, Ronnie. Sure. <laughs> Thank you.